Welcome to the Elk Talk Podcast with Randy Newberg and Corey Jacobson. Presented by the Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation. The goal is what little you and I know about elk hunting, we share with people. I've got an elk doing it's like 120 yards away. What do I do? First off, the thought would never cross my mind when an elk's being 120 yards away to call anybody on a cell phone. <laughs> All elk. All the time. Only elk. Only elk. Well, it's us having conversations. So we usually go down some rabbit holes. But if you hunt with Corey Jacobson, you will find the landscape is full of rabbit holes. We're just going to make this up as we go. And you look at it like, oh, that's a target rich environment. But if you're trying to single one out, a solo target there is much easier to go into than a, a big group. Well, we record everything, so there's no BS and no lying, no faking it with us. <laughs> Did we hit the record I button? I forgot to hit the record <laughs> button. If you want to know something about elk hunting, this probably isn't a podcast to listen to. <laughs> Could we give them a list of all the other podcasts wow. where they might learn something? <laughs> Hey, folks, I am here all by myself. Well, not all by myself, but without Corey Jacobson today, uh, recording an episode of the Elk Talk podcast brought to you by the Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation. And the reason Corey's not with me is this is the week that every year he goes and does this, uh, hunt, I think it's a hunt of a lifetime is, is what it's called. And he volunteers his time. Uh, for scouting, for calling, for everything, for these people who have serious uh, illnesses. Uh, and it is truly a hunt of a lifetime for them. So today we're without Corey, but I think when you find our guest, uh, listen to our guest, uh, you're going to find that maybe he should just take over this podcast and Corey and I just go do, well, whatever else we do shoot grouse or call elk or whatever because John Barclow, big game product manager from Sitka is going to be on this podcast once I click the button here and he is the most dialed in guy you'll, you'll ever talk to. Uh, so informed, so so good at, at just understanding equipment issues and how those apply to elk hunting fanatic archery elk hunter himself so really happy that he'll be able to join me here shortly but in the interim we want to make sure the world understands who makes the elk talk podcast possible uh, the Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation is the title sponsor of this, promotes it, uh, gives us resources, uh, lets us record in their studios, um, so many great things. In addition to their mission of ensuring the future of elk, other wildlife, their habitat, and our hunting heritage, uh, Elk Foundation, you're probably, if you're an elk hunter or want to be an elk hunter, you're going to have uh, some benefit from the work of the Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation. They've conserved now over 7 million acres of habitat for elk, improving it uh, through all of their, their great work since the, the Elk Foundation formed in 1984. Uh, and they're getting close to a million acres of improved public access, either access that was never there before uh, or access to lands that had difficult access and are now very accessible. Uh, can't thank them enough. Um, the, the, Corey always throws this part in here, so I, I, I got to be following notes here and make sure I get it in there. But if you want to follow the podcast, leave questions, leave comments, and I'm sure after we talk to John, you're going to have a lot of these comments, go to www.elktalkpodcast.com and leave your questions. Or if you want to follow us on Instagram, uh, on Instagram, it's at Elk Talk Podcast. So those, those are places where you can get a hold of us. In addition to the Elk Foundation, uh, Gerber Gear is the, the company of legendary blades of the big game vital, uh, the, the vital. Uh, the, so they really have two replaceable blade knives, the vital and big game vital. I use both of them. Uh, I also use a Gator Premium, which is their premium level hunting knife. Uh, I 
just a great company, supports all that we're doing here, wants to be the knife of, of elk hunting. Uh, go out to their website, uh, gerber.com, I believe it is, gerbergear.com gerbergear.com yeah uh and you'll see that they're more than just knives also they're all kinds of tools uh, multi-tools uh they have this whole new fishing line that i've been using uh really really good stuff uh they they have if you want to ask or, or read what their tagline is it's kind of their mission for what they do is to develop problem solving life-saving tools that empower people to be unstoppable uh, and for me, uh, it, they provide knives and tools that make elk hunting and all hunting that much better, uh, and help me take care of all the things I need when I have that animal on the ground. Uh, Sitka gear, turning clothing into gear is kind of their motto. Uh, and yeah, by doing that, they help hunters harvest a lot of elk and from Sitka gear today, our guest is John Barclow. Uh, Sitka, you, you'll hear a lot about, not Sitka specific, but just John's theories on uh, layering systems, synthetics versus wools versus downs versus whatever, uh, all kinds of good stuff there. Onyx Maps, uh, go to onyxmaps.com uh, and use promo code ELKTALK and you'll get 20% off any of their app products. Uh, they and the Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation right now have a sweepstakes going on and you can see it out at the Onyx website, onyxmaps.com. It's a sweepstakes where one of you are going to win a five-day rifle elk hunt with me, Randy Newberg. Uh, not Corey, but me. Uh, Corey will be doing the hunt of the lifetime as his donation next year again, I'm sure. So I'm doing kind of my uh, promo hunt next year is through the Elk Foundation and on X. Go there and sign up. One of you are coming on an all-expense-paid rifle elk hunt for five days in the fall of 2019 and uh can't thank thank the onyx folks enough again use promo code elk talk and get 20 percent off uh rocky mountain hunting calls uh, i don't know what to say about them Corey has won how many world elk calling championships using their calls um if you if you go to uh, RockyMountainHuntingCalls.com, BuglingBull.com, either of them will get you to their website. Use promo code ELKTALK, and they're going to give you 15% off anything you purchase from their website. Uh, the fact that I'm able to call in elk uh, occasionally speaks to the quality of their calls because I'm not that great of an elk caller. But if Corey swears by them, I swear by them. Uh, and then we have GoHunt.com. Uh, right now, uh, GoHunt has a 30-day free trial going on. And a lot of you hear us talk about this insider service. Corey and I both use it. It's how we get our tags um, for each of us. We need multiple tags every year for all the media content that we produce. So go to GoHunt.com forward slash elk talk e-l-k-t-a-l-k -L -L so go hunt.com forward slash elk talk and here's what's going to happen if you use that link to sign up for their 30-day free trial it's a no risk 30-day free trial and they're going to be running that through the end of the month even if you sign up on october 30th you're going to get 30 days into november that that you can use this insider service um we're going to choose five winners uh, on November 1st for people who use that gohunt.com forward slash elk talk link. And we're going to be giving away a Gerber knife package. So five of you who sign up using, uh, the elk talk, uh, URL are going to get drawn for this Gerber knife package. So there you have it folks, gohunt.com forward slash elk talk. And, uh, with that besides getting 30 days to look at the, the the whole product line everything the insider has to offer uh you're going to be in the drawing for these gerber knives so with that uh i think we've covered all of them let me see yeah rmef on x gerber sitka go hunt and rocky mountain hunting calls um in a minute john's going to come in here i'm going to click the the button 
you're going to hear a little click. And John Barclow, big game product manager from Sitka Gear, is going to be here. We're going to talk elk. We're going to talk elk hunting mistakes. And we're going to talk serious stuff about products because so many questions we've been getting at the uh, elktalkpodcast.com website have been equipment issues. Well, John is one of those guys who's dialed in. And if anybody can answer questions with absolute authority, it's John Barclow. So here we go, folks. Stay tuned. All right, folks. I told you that we would have as a guest today uh, a really great guy who I happen to know pretty well. Uh, We bump into each other at the coffee shop because my favorite coffee shop is right across the parking (laughs) lot from the Sitka Galactic headquarters. (laughs) Uh, And whenever I have a gear question... I call John Barclow, and John is the big game product manager for Sitka Gear. John, thanks for uh, carving. Here it is. It's the tail end of the elk rut, and I somehow talked you into giving me a couple hours of your time. Well, there's a reason for that. Um, You already tagged out. I did. Oh! I actually shot two bulls this year uh, in two states, so we can get into that. Yeah, first time ever. Really? uh, Well, you've made up for me then. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> because I've not, I've been in Alaska. Uh, yeah, well, congratulations, by the way. Well, thank you. Yeah, I, uh, I, I spent, I was in Montana three days in the month of August. Wow. And I was only in Montana five days a month of September. So I feel bad. We have such great archery elk hunting in Montana. We do. I think it's our best elk seasons are the archery seasons. It, it, it's an amazing opportunity we have here in Montana and, yeah. I mean, I'm kind of with you, and, and I mean, these are good problems to have, but but yeah. sometimes with our jobs, we get I know. kind of pulled out of state, right? And I just can't wait to get back home. Yeah, and so yeah. I, I end up in New Mexico for mm-hmm. archery elk in a heat wave of heat waves. Yeah, and then I end up in Wyoming for pronghorn, which my freezer was bare of pronghorn, but it's not now. Yeah, I love <laughs> I love antelope. So then I got back this week, and I told the crew, you know, we're going elk hunting every day. Well, then I ran into a tax deadline, the extended tax <laughs> deadline at the CPA firm and trying to get everything done before I head to Utah in two days. So you're, you're my hero this year. You're, you're always my hero, John, but this, <laughs> this year you've, so which states have you filled out tags in? Montana and Utah. And Utah? Oh, Utah? Yeah. Wow. Yep. Dang. Yep. Got the hunt of CWMU down there. So. Okay. Um, yeah, it, it's been, it's always a tough year, but yeah. I get to talk to a lot of people like you do from all over the West right. and it just seems like overall for various reasons. Yeah. Um, you know, the elk rut's been, been tough. It's yeah. like to use the word spotty or trickling in, but if you can find the right bull on the right day, he will, he will come running to his death. Right. And so you just have to be kind of persistent that way. But yeah, um, I think that really hot period from about September 5th to the 20th across much of the West, we got yeah. that really big high pressure system right. and unseasonably right. hot temps. I think that pushes the rut more as a nighttime activity mm-hmm. than a daytime activity. Yeah. But, and uh, the good thing about Montana that we're just so lucky for arch uh, as archery hunters is we get to hunt the first two weeks of October as well. Right. And you know, when I first came to the state, I was pretty, pretty desperate come the end of September. And then uh, I actually went hunting with David Brinker. Okay. In that first, you know, say around October 6th time frame, uh-huh. And we had amazing rut action. Yeah. Amazing rut action. And so I- I'm almost, maybe I shouldn't even say this, but, <laughs> but it, you know, but if I, if push come to shove, like I'll take that first 10 days of October. Right. And I think, you know, there's very few people in the woods then. They're all doing They've either tagged else. out or quit or moved on to something else, waiting for rifle. Yeah. You've got the place to yourself and, you know, call it a second estrus or whatever it is. Yeah. Um, I've had some really good luck. Yeah. Really I, good luck. I have too. And, and some of the states, like Wyoming has September 1st to the 30th as their archery season. So they run it pretty long. Yeah, yeah. Whereas some of the other states, let's use like Utah, Utah or Nevada. Nevada, yeah. <clears throat> those archery hunts are pretty early in the year where it's, you have a good likelihood that you're going to hit hot weather that can really force them into more of a nighttime activity than yeah. a daytime activity. And so, yeah. I think you have to know that going in, you know, I hunted, uh, that's, I don't know, three, three, four years ago down in Wyoming. 
mm-hmm. uh, for 15 days. And we just, because of schedules and stuff, we hunted the first two weeks of the season. And yeah. we were probably the most successful people we'd heard about, which was yeah. we were having one encounter a day. Yeah. Um, you know, and it didn't work out for us, but you really, yeah, you have to change your, you can't just say, well, I always call elk and this is what I do in Montana. And so it's going to work in Utah or Nevada. And that's not the case. Right. Not You've got to be so adaptable and just take what is given to you. Yeah. You know, when, when we were in New Mexico, it was so hot and it took us five days before we really got into elk. Mm-hmm. Just the, it's hard to locate elk if they're not making any noise. Yeah. yeah. You see their tracks, you see whatever at the water holes. Finally, the last day there's a, and you'd get a kick out of this. I've seen the footage. It's so crazy. There's seven young bulls in a group. Obviously they, they don't have any cows. They're just walking around like, Hey, you suppose we can find a, a, a cow here. And we started cow calling and they came running off the private onto the public five of the seven came in we thought it was cattle coming wow it was so noisy coming through the pinion yeah and all of a sudden there they are 12 15 yards away looking at us it's, so you just like when you were saying is you just got to adapt to what's there that's really what we ended up having to do you you draw these tags in new mexico and you think oh great big bulls and yeah they are there yeah but that doesn't mean you're gonna have the conditions or the opportunity to put an arrow on one of them. Yeah, no, same with Utah and Nevada, like you were saying, you know, I mean, those are some premium tags. And, you know, if you're lucky enough to draw, you're going to cash in a lot of points. You waited a lot of years. And, yeah, you know, the reality is whenever you can go down there, you might be sitting water. Yeah. You know, you might be sitting in a tree stand. I mean, and you've got to, <laughs> it's not maybe what you want to do, but you've got to kind of, you've got to kind of roll with that and, you, and not just keep forcing it. You, you do. And the reason I asked you to be on this podcast, John, one, you're a great guy. You've been on a lot of podcasts. You know the drill. Yeah. You're in high demand. (laughs) And uh, right now, normally Corey would be here with us, but he's in uh, Idaho helping one of those part of a lifetime things. Yeah. Which is awesome. uh, Yeah. He he does that every year. And I said, you know what, Corey, you continue to do that kind of generous charitable work make sure you guys get an elk and uh, I'll take over the podcast for a time or two. Uh, but we we have out on the, our website, it's elk podcast, elktalkpodcast.com where you can submit questions. For the month of September, I just sorted them. We have 159 emails wow. of people asking questions. A lot of them are equipment questions. Uh-huh. And you are a bit of my... Yeah, Hey, John, hey, I got this question and, and you're really, besides being knowledgeable, you're, you're very tolerant of my bothering <laughs> you. Uh, I love it. I, I appreciate love it. And every episode we do the Sitka question of the week. Yeah. Well, now right. that we have the Sitka guy here, maybe this episode is just... Every the, question could be the Sitka the, question. There, there you go. The Sitka <laughs> episode of the year or whatever. Um, so I've sorted the ones that are equipment related. Okay. And I think you're the guy who we want to really bend ears on with uh, a lot of the equipment stuff. But we don't let any of our guests off without talking about their five recurring mistakes or five mistakes they've made that once you kind of got over making them regularly, we still repeat them at times. Uh, We want the audience to know what are those mistakes because I think I learn most from the mistakes I make. It it seems like success comes from a series of bad mistakes. Yep, (laughs) always. (laughs) And and so we're we're interested in the audience getting to understand what what it might be that you've done a lot of elk hunting. You really are into the archery side of it. Maybe I'm not saying that right but yeah no for uh, sure i've uh, all the bulls i've killed have been with archery yeah that's um, just because of my choosing yeah yeah and so uh we're about so here we are early october it won't be long and we'll be shifting into a lot of rifle hunts yep and that's a completely different manner of hunting uh it, so many things are different with rifle than they are with archery uh but if 
when when I told you top five mistakes, what was the very first thing that came to your head? So the very first one that comes to mind and one I have to kind of mentally aggressively tell myself um, to do is to not be timid. Really? Um, yeah, because I, I, I probably hunted more. So I grew up back East whitetail hunting, mm-hmm. uh, you know, self-taught, very, uh, very uh, unsuccessfully, and then, <laughs> you know, kind of blended that into mule deer and blacktail hunting. And so when you, when you hunt animals like that and you're either sitting in ambush or you're going to spot and stalk, Mm-hmm. You're very surgical is the word I use. And, right. you know, you don't go in unless everything's perfect and you have to be, you know, so quiet. And I mean, the whole thing is just, it's, it's, it's just a very precise sniper, right thing yeah. that you're doing. Um, and so I tried to apply that to elk hunting and it, it just wasn't working. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I have killed bulls that way for sure. Yeah. Um, but you need to, you can make more noise. You need to be aggressive. Um, you can't be afraid of blowing out, you know, a small group or a herd of elk and with, with you know, the mindset that you're not going to find more. Yeah. Um, you you have, I, I have found that the more, not that you're just bumbling into bedding areas, but the more aggressive I can be, some people use the term running gun. I don't, yeah. I don't really run. Yeah. And I'm shooting a bow, so I'm not really gunning, but um, the, the more, the more uh, opportunities that I'm getting myself into. And yeah. if you can get yourself into a couple of those opportunities during a, you know, a hunt or a season, yeah. there's a good chance you're going to be able to capitalize on one of those. Yeah. Um, and so trying, just trying not to be timid and be more aggressive. It, it's, I mean, my, I'm aggressive by nature, which is kind of interesting, but when I walk into the woods and maybe because I don't personally consider myself a super experienced elk hunter like you or Corey, but, but, um, but when I go in there and, and kind of apply that aggressive nature, I've found that I have far more encounters and far more success. So that would be number one. That's the first thing that comes to mind. Everybody that we have asked this to, whether it's, uh, you know, Corey and I had to do it, uh, David Dirk. Brinker, Dirk, Donnie, all of them, everybody somewhere along their five has said it's either being too passive or don't be timid or know when to be aggressive. Every person has brought that up as one of their five points, which I hope the audience realizes that there, there's a reason why that's on everybody's list. Yeah. I, I, I'm like you. When I first started down, I was so passive. I was so worried. Oh, now I found them. I don't want right, to mess right. it up. Yeah. I want to be able to stay here and, and follow them around every day and my chance will come. Well, really? Uh, by being passive, some days they disappeared anyhow, and I never found them. So mm-hmm. what was I out by being super passive and staying right. 200 yards away? Like you, I should have plowed in there strategically, but I should have gotten closer. I shouldn't have worried about, well, what if I blow this opportunity? Yeah. I, I'll go find some more. Right. You, you know, you uh, work so hard to get in those situations though that, you know, and if you're traveling out West and you've only got seven or 10 days, you know, right. you're, I, I understand it. I mean, I, I'm, you know, like I said, I have to tell myself every time I step into the elk woods, okay, it's game on. It's time to be aggressive. And yeah. And, uh, you know, if you, if you break a stick, I mean, sometimes breaking a stick when you're walking, all of yeah. a sudden you, you hear a bugle. Yeah. You're like, I don't know, you know, that's, they elk make a lot of noise sometimes. <laughs> they can be super quiet, but they, they make a lot of noise when they want to. So, yeah. Well, I, and Corey takes that to the level of being aggressive in his tactics, not just in his overall approach, where mm-hmm. having hunted with him a couple of times, it was an eye opener for me to see how aggressive Corey is. And he just keeps going and going. And if he finds one that doesn't want to play, fine, we'll go find one that does. Yeah. Uh, he's the most aggressive yeah, I don't think I'm that aggressive. person yeah. I've, I've ever hunted with. And so I, I've taken that to some degree. You know, I'm probably over on the other end of the spectrum where I was as far as how I call and approach. Now I'm probably more towards Corey's end of the spectrum, but not still not there. There's yeah. a reason people leave notes on Corey's truck. <laughs> you call too much, <laughs> he gets after it, but he's got the success to, yeah. to go with it. Well, you know that, but that, so that leads me to, to my second one, uh-huh. um, which is fear, 
fear of calling. So uh-huh. I don't call enough, I don't think. Hmm. Um, I, I don't think I have confidence enough in my calling that I'm just willing to just go bugle in every basin or, yeah. or, or cow call. Um, I mean, when I do it, I've been successful, but I'm not, I don't feel confident enough all the time to just go and like Corey does right. and just go call to, to every elk, every basin, every yeah. draw. Um, I, I do like to listen. I would, I would prefer they, they speak first. I mean, yeah. who wouldn't? Right. Um, but, but that would be the second one is just fear of fear of screwing it up by calling too much. Okay. Um, uh, so I know that kind of doesn't right. necessarily think that it blends with being aggressive, but aggressive is, you know, getting in there, dogging the herd, following the elk, you know, being on the mountain. Um, but you also do have to call. Yeah. You, I, and I've learned that lesson more this year than any other year. It's interesting you say that because in the this sorted pile of emails I have here, a lot of them are people who say, I don't feel like I'm that great of a caller, so I don't mm-hmm. call very much. And I'm not that great of a caller. I, I, when we put YouTube videos up, people are like, Newberg, practice some more. I <laughs> practice all the time. Yeah. But uh, I have found that the more I call, the more encounters I have. Yep. And it's taken me a long time to get to where I, every ridge or drainage I go into, I do a series of calls. Oh, not near. Oh, on to the next one, Mm -hmm. on to the next one. And I can't say I'm, I'm the world's greatest elk hunter at all. Uh, but I feel that I'm now kind of over that hump of worrying. What do I sound like? Last year it was mid October. We're in New Mexico. We're with uh, the our guest hunter Tracy Pettit, and this bull is just going crazy. And I didn't have my bugle or anything with me. I had one cow call, and uh, I still have it. It's this little blue one from mm. Rocky Mountain Hunting Calls. And I thought, well, I'll just do a really whiny cow call and see what happens. Oh my goodness, this guy—he's came on walking over, yeah. And what it taught me is don't do what you want to do. Do what the uh, do what the bull wants to hear. Mm-hmm. So we stayed there and I whine. I'm sure people listened to that and thought, Newberg, you, what, you slam your dog's tail in the door <laughs> or something? What's the deal? But that's what that bull wanted. And so without a bugle or anything, I just cut my hands and I... And finally, he came into 70 yards and Tracy smoked him. But uh, to me, that that was a, another one of those events in my calling of getting over some fears that I got to sound perfect. Yeah. It, yeah, I mean, Corey's probably the better one to, to talk to about elk calling. But the thing that, so we called three bulls in and killed three bulls that we called in that came running from half a mile away in, in two different states, but, but three bulls. And... So, um, you know, I'm, I'm listening to not only the calling that we're making, but I'm listening to the elk sounds. Yeah. And um, you tell me a bugle that sounds the same. You tell me a cow <laughs> call that sounds exactly the same. I mean, I've yeah. heard some things and I'm like, there's no way that that is an elk making that noise, although yeah. it is. Yeah. And, and so that kind of gave me the confidence to go, listen, even if I screw up one chirp, like it's not going to potentially blow this scenario up. No. Um. And if you talk to the right elk and tell them the right thing, the thing I've taken the most from, from Corey over the last couple of years, he said one thing in the linguists, uh, you know, and he said this in his seminars and stuff, but you know, what are you trying to tell the elk? And you have to put emotion in that. Yep. And for me anyways, and again, not being a world champion elk caller, to me, it's more important to put the emotion in and maybe it not sound exactly the way it should on the tape yep. um, than anything else. And, and that's... That's those uh, those elk are responding to that emotion. I think. Yeah, I, I that's the one part of the linguist that is mentally yeah. in my head. No, it's too. burned into my head. Yeah. Yep, both in my cow calling and in my bugling. I and Corey's dad, Rocky, who owns yeah. Rocky Mountain Hunting Calls. He I was at his shop, and he said, "Randy, think of what are you trying to do? What what are you trying to tell him?" Hmm. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, he, and his point was puts put something in there like you mean this right okay so i did and and back to your point of not sounding perfect in arizona last year i drew an early rifle tag for a marginal unit 
but I think it was October 8th or 9th was the day I shot that bull. And I thought it was a burl. That's how, <laughs> that's how bad this elk sounded. Some of them are horrible. I told the camera crew, I'm like, you guys are jerking my chain here. I had to, it, it sounds like a bear or a burl. And we walked in there and we had one of the camera guys back calling and pretty soon here came this burrow, but he had six points on each side. Yeah. Yeah. And he got to be a TV star. <laughs> <laughs> so point being, don't, and there's no perfect sounding elk. Now, some of those areas where the, the elk are bugling, those bulls are bugling all the time. They start to, I, I say they start to lose their voice and get hoarse. Uh, they make some of the craziest noises <laughs> and they're some of the biggest bulls on the mountain, you know, and they're yeah. just, you're like, there's no way that's an elk. And yeah. it is. Yeah. Yeah. So don't be timid. Get over your fear of calling. Yep. So the next one is uh, something we just touched on earlier, which was um, failure to adapt to the situation. So, you know, you go out there, you've got this idea in your head of how you want the hunt to go, what you want it to be, how you want this thing to go down and to try to keep forcing. So for instance, um, we, we talked early season mm -hmm. or some of these, some of these uh, Southern states southwestern states yeah um you go down there and, and and call in early august you're you're probably going to be very unsuccessful you might have to sit water yeah. you know you might have to sit a travel corridor you you might have to do things that you don't want to do you might have to set up a ground blind right like these are not things i want to do like they're <laughs> viscerally like against uh. everything that i want to do and i, I want a certain experience with an elk hunt but you, you're just going to keep beating your head against the wall. And so do you want to be successful or do you want to have a certain experience? And I would say if you want a certain experience and you should probably limit yourself where you go and when you go. Right. Um, but to try to tell myself, okay, here's the cards that are dealt. Here's the chessboard that I'm playing on. Here's the, you know, the weather, the terrain, the moon phase, whatever it is, um, you know, the herd, the hunting pressure, and you have to be able to adapt and, it's a little liberating when you, when you actually kind of, when I free my mind to go, okay, I'm just going to go and hunt and kind of work off instinct. Um, I, I wish we would have done this podcast before I went to New Mexico <laughs> because I was trying to force the elk to do we what wanna do it. I wanted them yeah. to do. I spent five days of a seven day hunt trying to get them to do what I wanted them to do. Mm -hmm. And as you were saying this, that's why you saw the big smile on my face. Yeah. It's like, all right, Randy, you failed to adapt until the sixth day. The sixth evening, I went and sat water. And I told the camera, I said, you know, I would rather immerse my bare bottom in hot fryer grease than to go sit in a blind. But that's what I'm going to do tonight because it's hot and I've seen all these elk trucks. Yep. That night, if not for a vehicle pulling up just below that water source and delaying them as they were coming down, with... Five to 10 minutes after legal shooting light, a 330 inch bull was laying in that water wow. hole, bugling at 30 yards. Wow. Moral of the story or lesson to be learned, Randy, why didn't you do that earlier? Why did you spend five days of your hunt trying to get the elk to do what they didn't want to do, but you wanted them to? Mm -hmm. uh, yep. Number three well, is a we, really good one, John. We, we just, we have a certain idea in mind of what we want our hunts to be. Yeah. And uh, that's fine, but you're not going to be as successful as if you're adaptive to, to kind of the, the situation. Um, the bullheaded nature of some of us. Oh, I'm does, stubborn does, as they get. Doesn't right? fit well with number three. No, it doesn't. Failure to adapt to the situation. Yeah. Guilty as charged. <laughs> <laughs> oh, gosh. Oh, man. I'm... I am. I'm, I'm guilty. J this season. I, I, I mean, I, I'm glad you brought that one up because I, I think there's a lot of people listening who are now going replaying in their mind times when maybe they didn't adapt well enough. Yeah. Until the last day of the hunt. Like me, the last two days of the hunt, we Well, because you kind of, yeah, yeah, you almost kind of are forced into it at a certain <laughs> point because you don't want to, you don't want to quote fail, right? I mean, not right. that not killing is failing, but, yeah. um, yeah, I know mean, you want to kind of leave it all out there, and right, yeah. And you, I mean, you, that's what Mother Nature's doing, right? They're they're right. constantly adapting, and it's so hard for us to, for me and my my structured life and my structured way of thinking to be able to 
to kind of free myself up to do that. But when I do it, I love it. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, well, I even, the last day of that hunt, I was going to go spot and stock. I thought, you know uh-huh. what? If, if it's this hot sure. and they're not bugling, if they're bedded out in these grasslands or in these trees, I'll even do that. Yep. Yep. But, oh, well. So that's I, a great I, one. I, uh, I, I don't know if it, it, people that follow Seinfeld, you know, this, there was this character, George Costanza. And so there was this episode where I'm a big Seinfeld ep, a fan, but, but so there was this episode where, uh, Jerry says to George, he says, George, if every instinct and thought you've ever had in your life was wrong, then the opposite must be right. And though, so, so he goes ahead and does this and all of a sudden he starts getting jobs and women and money and all this kind of stuff. And so every time we get into a, uh, you know, a, a tough situation on a hunt and things aren't going right, I, I like to call the audible and call out the Costanza method of elk hunting, which is <laughs> whatever I actually think is the right thing to do, I literally force myself to do the opposite. Oh, and I wow. tell you, Randy, it's crazy because you're like, well... Like, I, I know if I go this way that the wind's going to be blowing down Canyon for, you know, half this stock and this and that. And you're just like, hell with it. I'm going to pull like a stanza and go for it. And a lot of times you realize that halfway into it, that the wind is actually switched and is actually to your advantage. And you would have never known unless you went, right? Yeah. And so sometimes just kind of forcing yourself to, to kind of switch it up a little bit. Um, there, I mean, there's nothing written in stone. This, this is not like if you do A, B, and C, you get D. Right. This is a constantly adaptive kind of uh, environment. So I like to call it the Costanza method of elk hunting. But we, I think we're going to like, <laughs> you and George can share the royalties off that, <laughs> that trademark of, of that manner of elk hunting. I've, the George Costanza method. I, <laughs> I, we're going to get a ton of emails now, John, from people <laughs> saying, can you elaborate on the Costanza method of elk hunting? Yeah, Re- it's, really, it's be a contrarian. Is that what you're yeah, saying? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's, a, you know, it, the, the books and the experts say that in this situation, I should do this. Yeah. But that doesn't mean that that is the right thing to do because you can't write a book for this wild, crazy thing we call elk hunting. Right. And you know? the elements, the conditions, the hunting pressure, the, the million of, uh, the million uncontrolled items. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I think when people are, and I, I get asked tons of questions. And so I try to say in most instances, assuming this, well, that's m- m- trying to assume that the, all the variables are what I'm answering the question to. Right. And right. Well, we had, yeah. we had a group of, we had, we had a herd of elk with a 330 bull, um, a couple hundred yards in front of us. And we had the wind at our back and we were literally mm-hmm. like scrambling to get, get out of there because we kind of, you know, walked up, saw these animals mm-hmm. and we're like, why are they not winding us? And we looked, we were with a photographer. He actually mm-hmm. saw it. And we look in the trees, the aspens where these elk were the wind you could tell was blowing left to right. And that's why they weren't smelling us. So we literally went at these elk with the wind at our back. (laughs) Craziest thing, right? You're like, this is never going to work. And about a hundred yards from those, from that herd, the wind switched and was blowing left to right. And we got right in on them, never got a shot. Yeah. But if you would have just, you know, reacted on instinct, you'd have, you'd have, you'd have run the other way. Yeah. It's like, okay, wait a second. This doesn't seem like it's going to work, but but there's enough here that's telling us that this is probably you know worth worth the shot. Yeah, and uh, you know wind's uh, a, wind's a crazy one. I mean, you could figure you could study wind for the rest of your life and not have it all figured out. So we're going to call that the Costanza method of elk hunting. Yeah. All right. Yeah. I, I like that. <laughs> we might even title the podcast <laughs> George Costanza's <laughs> Manner of Elk Honey uh, what's your next one so the next one I've uh, you know I've, I've heard some other people say but I'm, I'm, I'm guilty of this all the time and that's you know leaving elk to find elk and <sighs> you know there's there's a bunch that goes to that so you know you know the elk are there they're not calling and you know obviously Corey's got his method. He likes to go and, and keep finding an elk that wants to talk, but mm-hmm. you put so much time and effort into finding these animals. And especially if you can get eyes on and know what they are, 
Mm-hmm. Um, stay with them. Yeah. I, I, I just have found that sometimes you're looking for the needle in the haystack. So for instance, you know, you said it what took five days, something like yeah. that to find the animals. Yeah. Like if they weren't, if they weren't calling and acting the way you want, why would you possibly walk away from them? You've right. got to try to, you got to try to figure out that situation and see, it, it, at least see and probe and, and figure out if there's any opportunity there whatsoever. Yeah. You know, um, it's funny. We, we have not yet released the podcast that's going to release in three days. Uh huh. So you haven't heard it. No, I haven't. But, no. but no one's heard it other than Corey and I because oh, we recorded okay. it and we talked about don't leave fish to find fish. That, that every fisherman knows that. Yeah, there you Why go. Why do I, as an elk hunter, and I did it in New Mexico. When you said that, I'm like, John, have you listened to the pod? You couldn't <laughs> have listened to the podcast because it's not released yet. But yeah, on day three, we found some elk and mm-hmm. we we're packing up our llamas, getting ready to go in further, right? Right. Oh, you got to get way in there. Well, there's two bulls bugling right at daylight. Well, we're loading up our llamas, getting ready. And I left them. Yeah. Uh, why? It's stupid. Why not kill one right, quarter they, mile from camp? <laughs> right. They were right out of trailhead. Uh, uh, maybe, uh, uh, Randy, you're so stupid. You, do, you don't want to kill elk by a trailhead? But what? Well, <sighs> it go, it, but it goes back to that being adaptive. So, you know, and I can't speak for you, but you, you had the llamas, you invested the time, you've got this idea, this imagery in your head of yep. what you want to do, <laughs> and you're going to kill this thing six miles back, and you're going to haul um, it out on llamas. Yep. <laughs> that your mind just didn't immediately go to, well, let's just walk over, keep the llamas tied to the trailer. Let's walk over here and try to kill the elk, you know, a quarter mile from here. Right. Um, I'm yeah. so embarrassed now. I, I've looked at the footage Uh huh. and we're, we're loading up. We got headlamps on and you can hear these elk bugling out behind us, maybe a half mile away. I, I I blush and start sweating yeah, every time I, I see. see the footage. It's so stupid. Well, I you know, and I want to encourage people to go as far into the backcountry as possible. Yeah. Because as I get older, I, I want to not do that. <laughs> um, so I it, plus I you know I mean that's where sick gear really shines. But um, mm. but y- you know you you gotta you gotta kill them where they are. Right. You know. Yeah. So yeah, so that would be that would be number four. And then number five is really more archery specific. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I, I've, I've made the mistake. Uh, I've seen others make the mistake, especially relatively new archery hunters. Um, I did not make the mistake this year. Um, but you have to, you have to, you know, basically be able to know when to draw and, and more importantly, take the first reasonable shot that you were offered. So if you were waiting now, I'm not, in, by no means am I saying to take uh, unethical shots. Right. But what I'm saying is, if you wait for that animal to be completely broadside, looking away from you, you know, this whole thing, like, you're going to potentially leave a lot of opportunity on the table, where, and this is maybe a plug for for subalpine, the, the, the pattern, but, you know, I had a bull, he was at 30 yards, you know, he came in, he was at 30 yards, and... I wasn't able to draw before he cleared. And I said, if he's going to let me draw my bow, I'm going to kill him right there. Mm-hmm. And I came, slowly came to full draw and shot him yeah. looking right at me. Wow. And, you know, we're in the past, I'd have been like, oh, he's looking. There's no way I can draw my bow. I'm just going to sit here and let this right. situation either develop or dissolve. Yeah. And... So he came in 30 yards, he's broadside, he's looking over towards your direction. Yeah, because we had been calling and he was in the timber Yeah, and, you know, he came out and I, I generally knew the yardage, Yeah, but I couldn't tell you to one yard, Right. but I could probably tell you to two yards plus or minus. Right. And I said, this is the opportunity if he's, cause he was calm. I said, yeah. if he's going to let me draw. I'm going to kill him right where he yeah. stands, and I did. So rather than me, who would say, well, I'm going to wait till he turns and looks the other way and moves his front leg forward, I, I've, I'm i guilty. Well, I, well, he, I'm he, always he, trying for that perfect shot. I, I think you should always try for the perfect shot, you know, and I may get a lot of people that question me on this, and I'm certainly not saying, you know, to take an unethical shot. Right. But, you know, this, this year alone, I saw a 15-yard frontal. Mm-hmm. I saw... Uh, a quarter and two, mm-hmm. you know, not hard quarter and two, but a quarter and two. 
where you're you're definitely going to hit them at least in one lung and right through the liver and diaphragm. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I drew on a bull that was looking at me. Now, mind you, 30 yards, he, on the, in the footage, he moved a little bit, but mm-hmm. you know, I always aim lower third, like we were just talking before we started this podcast. Yeah. These, these opportunities, archery hunting are so few and far between. And especially for somebody new who's starting out that if you're waiting for the perfect opportunity, you know, you could be waiting a very long time. And by no yeah. means am I saying take an unethical shot. Right. Elk are very, very tough. They're incredibly durable. Um, nobody wants to lose an animal, Mm -hmm. but that again, going back to number three about, I want this thing to be a certain way because this is the way I picture it in my mind. Like very rarely in reality, is that exactly what happens? Yeah. You know, do, do you think, because you are meticulous in your equipment, John? Yeah. And you practice a lot. Yep, year round. You have a level of confidence that's probably higher than most people. 100%. 100%. Do you, do you, do you have, is that just by nature that you're that meticulous about your equipment so that when that 30 yard shot comes and even though the bull, yeah, he's mostly broadside and he's looking at you that you've practiced so much, you have so much confidence in your setup that you, you're like, no, this is slam dunk. Where I mean, it? anybody can make a mistake, but I'm really confident that I know where to put the arrow and I know I can put the arrow yeah. there. And Dirk's yep. number five point, I think, uh, is, in his top five mistakes was not knowing your equipment and having confidence. In yeah. It. And yeah. So the other uh, thing that, uh, so this bull I killed in Utah, I had to shoot, I had a, I had a small window to put my arrow in to kill this bull. And, uh, and I've seen a lot of archery hunters make this mistake as well, where they wouldn't take a shot and I'm either behind them calling or something like that. I'm like, why didn't you shoot? And they said, well, I, I didn't know if I could put my arrow through this, through this hole in the brush or arc it over a limb or something. Mm -hmm. And it's real easy to figure out, but it takes a little bit of practice, but I knew exactly where my arrow flight was going to go based on my pins. And so, yeah, that, that familiarity is Again, I don't necessarily rifle hunt anymore, but that familiarity with your equipment, especially the weapon system, mm-hmm. uh, it, it cannot be overstated. Yeah. I mean, it just, and, and, you know, even if you're perfect, sometimes it doesn't always work out exactly right. the way you want. But, right. um, you know, with, with archery hunters and, you know, I've talked to some folks, you know, here who are, you know, pretty, pretty successful gun hunters when they're getting into archery. And it, you know, I just, I can't stress it enough that you have to be completely familiar. I think shooting the same setup every year, the same arrow weight, the same arrow speed, or generally if you go from bow to bow, if you try to keep things the same, you start to learn the trajectory of that arrow. You know, I shoot a relatively heavy arrow. Um, I know what it's going to do. I've seen, you know, and and the more animals you kill successfully, like the more confident you get. But I just see people, you know, either not know when to draw and, and they hesitate um, or they don't take that that really good shot, but it's not like the perfect shot, right. like textbook in the book right. when it's this, you know, one dimensional, completely broadside animal with the legs slightly forward. It's, you know, if you learn the anatomy, study the anatomy of these animals and you really realize that you've got a little bit more of a window than, than you think. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I've seen a lot of, I've, I've done that a lot, certainly earlier in in my, in my archery career, so to speak. Um, and, uh, and I see a lot of people make that mistake all the time. Yeah. Yeah. All the time. And I would rather people not shoot than shoot if they're not confident. Sure. But I would just say you would increase your odds if you practice with your gear and, and knew when, and, and, you know, Tyler Jonathan's a friend of ours, yep. right? And, and Tyler told me this, and this was something that stuck with me, has stuck with me since he, t- since he told me this. He goes, the success or failure of a hunt and uh, in, in the time we were hunting elk, and I think specifically with elk, but, you know, it can come down to fractions of a second success or failure. For sure. And he says, you really have to work on instinct and not try to, I'm a person that likes to overthink and overanalyze everything, you know, and I'm (laughs) studying the business and the market and all this kind of stuff and scrutinizing product. You have to be able to operate on instinct. And and sometimes that fraction of a second of when to draw, when not to draw can mean that the difference between success and failure and just being able to, you know, be so comfortable to just work on that instinct and not have to overthink things. 
uh, hooking up your release or framing your site yeah. picture or whatever it is, yeah. you know, I think you'll find that, uh, or people will find that, you know, they may, they may have a little bit more success. Yeah. So. No, I, I would say that's the case. And I'm, I, now that I have an archery range in my yard, yeah, it's a beautiful amazing thing, isn't it? <laughs> how much more confidence I have yeah. in archery. Whereas I come from a rifle hunting background and when I'm out rifle hunting, because, well, ammo's free to me, all these companies, uh, they're yeah. sending me rifles and scopes. I shoot a lot. It is so instinctive. I don't really even give it a second thought about right. anything. And I'll have camera guys say, wow, that was a hard shot. Like, really? It. No, it's really not that hard. Whereas I'm still working to get to that point in the archery world. And I find myself coming to draw and then not shooting because of some of the things you just mentioned. It's all right. And you're waiting for the perfect shot. And part of that is, is because I'm, I'm not at that confidence level in the archery world as I am in the rifle world. Yeah. It just, yeah. But yeah, so, you know, and I know Corey, I, 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 and I applaud him for doing this, but when he started the uh, Elk 101 University or yep. University of Elk. University I, of Elk. Yeah, yep. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and, and he had written some articles prior to that, but, you know, that he he talked about that frontal shot. Mm -hmm. And and he, you know, he, he showed that he had done the due diligence of dissecting the animals and taking pictures, and then obviously he's had success. And, you know, if... And people don't promote it, which I'm, I'm okay with to a right. point, but you know, when you, when you start to talk to folks and I won't mention any names, um, but that are very successful year after year with their archery hunting and they're killing big bulls, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of these folks have been taking frontal shots at, for 20 years. Right. At eight yards. At eight yards. yards or whatever. Right. Yeah. Where... And that's kind of a case in point. If you know the anatomy, you know your equipment, you know, you know where to shoot. How many opportunities have myself and other people, you know, maybe even you given up over the years of bulls Plenty. coming straight on less than 20 yards and you're waiting, you know, is it more ethical to shoot that elk when he's looking at you straight on and he's looking over your shoulder because he, you know, your buddy's behind you calling 80 yards and you're going to put it right in the center of his chest? Or when you try to shoot him on the fly as he spins and wheels out of there because he gets your wind. Yeah. You know, I would argue that you're better off maybe taking the standing shot, knowing the anatomy and putting it where it needs to be. So yeah, yeah, not enough said on that, but yeah. So that's, that's something I've had to learn over the years and, and kind of keep telling myself prior to the hunt. And then I try to run an instinct after that. So, <laughs> well, that kind of is a, a really good lead into all these gear questions. So, uh, I don't know where we want to start with them. I've sort I'm, I've got my laptop up here. You don't get the benefit of seeing it, <laughs> but I've got all of these emails and trying to figure out which questions to ask first. A lot of them are clothing and product specific. So I, I don't know if you want to start there. Um, a very common one. Uh, there's yeah, let's start there, with the common There's things. three of them here. Okay. Of what broadhead do you use? And, and I know that might sound elementary and the answer might be it, you know, whatever works for you, but I, our audience is interested uh, for elk, not for other species, but for elk. Yeah. You don't need to say brand, but if you want to elaborate on fix versus mechanical yeah, no, I don't, versus... I don't, yeah, so I, I have shot elk in the past with mechanicals mm -hmm. and I have never had a bad experience. Yeah. Uh, with that said, there was a part of me that felt like I was maybe getting away with something. Okay. Um, and so I switched to, uh, a, a fixed head or, or I would say semi fixed head. So I've been shooting the, the large original Ram cat. Okay. I've killed, uh, four bulls with those broadheads. And I think the collective distance they've traveled is maybe 200 yards total <laughs> out of four out wow. of four huh. um uh so I, I i shoot that i i like them um i'm not i'm not a big fan of some of the fixed blades that are that are just a really tiny cut mm -hmm. i mean you know let's admit it sometimes having a having a wider cut right um can can, can kind of save you right uh i will admit that with all that said, that this year I killed one of my bulls with an expandable, uh -huh. and it was the, and I'll tell you why, but it was the uh, the Rage Tripan. 
Okay. Which I, I have found to be uh, an exceptional head. Um, I can pull 12 out of the pack, build up my arrows, put them, spin them, and I don't, all, tw- all 12, I can get all 12 to, to just spin like tops. Hmm. Uh, I think part of it's just the titanium and the process that they make and the way titanium is machined over uh, stainless. Um, really big cut, but something I started doing a few years ago, and, and when you live out West, you know, it, it probably makes a little more sense, but I'm able to tune my bows to the point where I can shoot a, in this case, I can shoot my Ramcat and my tripan and they group the same. Really? And wow. the tripan will group maybe just, just a, you know, a skosh better at say beyond 60. Yeah. Not that I want to take that shot beyond 60, but that's my point. Um, either in high wind situations or if you have to do a follow-up shot, yeah. um, I, I will run uh, one or two mechanicals in a six arrow quiver. I will run one or two mechanicals in there. Wow. Um, because I know they group the same. Mm-hmm. I'll always try to go for the the fixed head to start. Yep. Um, but the, the night I killed uh, the bull in Montana, it was exceptionally windy. Yeah. Exceptionally windy. It just came up, you know, it could hardly hear bugles and et cetera. And even though I killed that bull at 30 yards, when I pulled the arrow out of my quiver, the thought process was, I don't want to leave anything to chance. I don't want to leave any little bit of wind drift. Yeah. And so I pulled the mechanical. It was close range. You know, it's not that I was shooting and it's not, was, it wasn't like my bow was blowing all over the place, right. but I just didn't want to take any chance. Mm-hmm. Um, but if you have to do a follow-up shot, you know, you get an arrow in him. If the bull's going to stand there, I'm always going to try to shoot uh, him again. And sure. if he's at 60, 70 yards and he's already got an arrow in him, mm-hmm. like I'll always try to shoot again. And at right. that point, you know, I'll try to follow up with, with a mechanical if possible, just because again, wind drift at that distance. And so I've, I've been doing that for a couple of years now. I, I learned that from a guy and, you mm-hmm. know, if you tune your bows, you really have to work on your equipment and really yeah. know exactly what you're doing. But, um, Huh. But anyways, yeah, the Wacom has been a great head for me over the years, and uh, I've, I've shot some good ones. I shot the Almers um, uh-huh. for a couple years there before before they went away. But uh, but yeah, I, I will always try to put a a the the biggest fixed blade head that'll fly out of my bow uh, in, well, into an elk if possible. Hundred or hundred twenty five. I, I shoot a hundred, okay. but I put fifty grains of brass up front. Oh, okay. So you know, I, and I, I don't want to. There's been plenty of discussions yeah, right. about no. FOC, but yeah, I right. put fifty grains of brass, and then I put a hundred grain head. Okay. Um, yep. Huh. Release. What style of release? So because I because there's a question on that. I so thought. I Since shoot. We're a, on it, we so I shoot all. a thumb trigger, uh, okay. but more specifically, I shoot a tension activated release. Yeah. And more specifically than that, I shoot a knock on archery uh, silverback release. Okay. So it's a two finger thumb release. Uh, it's tension activated, so it's you know set to to activate X number of pounds, say four to five pounds over my holding weight. Right. Um, I started shooting that about a year and a half ago. Uh, that particular release, I've shot thumbs for a very long time now. Um, the thing I like about that release is it makes me execute the shot the same way every time yeah. if I'm shooting at foam or if I'm shooting at a live animal. Right. And so that, and it's taken me a year. If you ever, you know, choose to commit to a release like that, I would say give yourself a year. Hmm. Um, but I've, I, I've lost count, but I'm probably close to 20 animals now that I've killed with that particular release. Wow. Um, and it's, it's just been exceptional. Uh, yeah. to me so great yep and i always carry two releases because you never know crazy stuff happens but. <laughs> i always do also yep. I, people look at me like what, what i'm a little a paranoid that way i i've left the house without my release before <laughs> yeah. I've, I've done some stupid yeah. things and yeah yeah i worry about that my both releases are absolutely identical yep uh, yep so yep i think that's important for sure huh well that's interesting stuff i'd say in the archery world that's as common of a question as I get in the rifle world of what cartridge and what bullet. Yeah. Uh, yeah, sure. It's, uh, and I, I'll tell people what I use when it comes to the rifle world, but I always tell them whatever it is, there's no necessarily right or wrong. Make sure you're 
proficient with it and you're confident in it. Yeah. Because if you're confident, you're not going to have these doubts going through your head of, ooh, I'm, I, I, when I pull the trigger, whether on my release or on my rifle, I want that this before the release happens or the trigger hits the primer, I want that feeling of this animal's dead. Yep. That's yep. how much confidence I want to have. Yep. You, you don't and, have any, you don't have any room for doubt, yeah. honestly. I mean, it's such yeah. a difficult thing to, to, to kill these animals, you know, yeah. uh, cleanly and ethically that, yeah, but it, it's familiarity and confidence. And yeah, I mean, everybody, you know, depending on what your draw length is and what your, your poundage is and all these kind of things in state, you know, there's different state laws. Right. Um, yeah, but you know, I think the common thread here is we spend a lot of time scrutinizing, practicing, gaining proficiency, and then just being supremely confident. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, now we're gonna the, gonna ask a couple questions because it expands on uh, a topic that I think in the podcast Corey and I did with Dirk, we were talking about merino versus yeah. synthetics uh -huh. and there's a bunch of questions in here about layering systems and and they all the audience knows that sitka is one of the presenters of this podcast and you're the guy john you when it comes to big game clothing and systems there's nobody who can nerd out on this <laughs> more than you can. And I say I'll that, take that as a compliment. Uh, yeah, I say that based on experience because yeah, yeah. you and I have had so many of these discussions. You've handed off some stuff to me and said, go try this. Tell me what you think of it. Does it work? Where, where the flaws might be or what really stands out as, a, as a, an asset. Um, and we were talking about synthetics versus merinos in that past podcast. And everybody knows I'm a Merino guy. Uh, I'm not necessarily asking you if you're one or the other, but w where across the spectrum do you see the application of one versus the other? Yeah, Am so, I you know, base layer, and, and I define base layer as the, the layer that's directly next to your skin. Yep. You know, it's a foundational part of any clothing system. Mm -hmm. um, certainly any of these technical hunting systems. It's, it's the foundation. Um, I've been on record as, as saying um, that I'm not anti-merino, mm -hmm. but that I'm pro-synthetic. <laughs> and, uh, okay. and, and so what I mean by that is my, my, kind of my default position is to go to synthetics, but there really is, as you and I were talking, there's, there's, no, uh, there's no right or wrong answer, um, but it is condition dependent. Um, and there's a lot of conditions. So that condition could be uh, weather. Uh, it could be your body type chemistry. Um, you know, do you sweat a lot? Do you not sweat a lot? You know, different yep. things. It seems like, and I'm not, certainly not a scientist in this regard, but it seems like certain people's maybe pH, um, you know, they, they stink more than other people, you know? And, yeah. and so everybody's got to adapt. I would say the best thing to know or understand is the difference between synthetics and Merino. And so let's go into that. Yeah. So I had somebody tell me a long time ago, we were going through this, that, that really all they're trying to do with synthetic base layers is, is try to, to mimic wool, which is a natural fiber, obviously, and then try to um, try to solve some of wool's uh, deficiencies, shortcomings. Yeah, right. So let's let's start with wool. Um, and we've Sitka's got a, a a new wool program out this year that I think is exceptional. I think it's as good as anything in in not only the hunting market but certainly the mountain the mountaineering outdoor space. As someone who's been using it for the last two months, yeah, I agree. Yeah, perfect, <laughs> perfect. Um, so there's three there's three weights, but um, but so merino's got some some interesting properties, and um, and I won't get into all of it, but it's it's about scaling and lanolin and all these kind of things. It's in this this natural great fiber. Um, Merino essentially is warm when, it, I don't like to say wet, but I'll say warm when moist, right? Yeah. Warm when there's moisture uh, in, in the garment. Right, perspiration. Um, for, right, yeah. which is great. Um, in, a, in, a, in a cold environment, that even though it's wet, it'll keep you warm for a while. 
Um, but in a hot environment, having that moisture next to your skin actually promotes cooling, conductive cooling, right. convective cooling, et cetera. Um, so it's got a really broad range of conditions that Merino is comfortable. Um, the, 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 the natural antimicrobial property, so that means that its natural ability for it not to stink, uh, you know, at the end of your 10 day dull sheep hunt or whatever the case may be. Those are great things, especially when you're hanging out with a guy in a small backpack <laughs> tent, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, so wool is a, a fantastic uh, product. There's, uh, you know, a couple deficiencies, I'd say one, it's maybe not as durable as some synthetics, especially when you get into some of the, the thinner weights. And um, more importantly to me is that it, it, it does stay wet longer than a synthetic. Yep. Um, but, but it's got its, right, we talked about the upsides of that. Synthetics, on the other hand, um, really by nature of what they're made out of, really can't, the fiber actually can't absorb moisture. The, the, the garment as it's, as it's woven can, you know, can hold some moisture, but it's really, really, really efficient at taking the moisture on your skin, moving it through that base layer onto whatever the next layer is or the outside atmosphere. Um, so it doesn't stay wet very long. And the garment that's not wet uh, and keeps your skin dry allows your body to thermoregulate. So yeah. either stay, stay cool or, or, uh, or, or stay warm. Um, some of the deficiencies of that though are one, some of those lightweight base layers are so efficient at moving moisture from the skin to the next layer that when people stop, they actually feel like they're cooling down. Yeah. Um, and in and in some regard, they are because the moisture is moving so fast to the next layer that there is a little convective uh, or Heat. conductive right. uh, loss. Um, but it's only for a very short amount of time, and that the proper application of layers when you stop can kind of prevent that from from feeling that way. Uh, so for instance, if I, you know, if you and I hike to the top of a ridge and we sweat up our layers and I'm wearing a synthetic base layer and I get up there and I start feeling like I'm, I'm losing heat because it's moving the moisture so fast, the application of any kind of puffy jacket to kind of trap that heat, uh, but still uh, promote that movement of moisture is going to solve that issue. And in five minutes, I'm going to be dry with my synthetic base layer and you may be you know, damp for say 20 minutes. Right. Right. Because so, I'm wearing a Merino or something. Correct. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. So the, the other deficiency of synthetic is that it doesn't have any natural antimicrobial properties. Right. So if there's no application aftermarket application uh, to the garment, it is going to pick up stink like almost immediately and it's not <laughs> going to let it go. Yeah. And you know, at the end of a 10 day sheep hunt, not only will, uh, you be disgusted by me, but I'll be disgusted by myself. And so, you know, what, what, uh, what, what we've done at Sika is uh, applied this uh, environmentally friendly, naturally occurring silver salt uh, to the garment, which it's called polygene. And so that, that, uh, that kind of cuts down on the garment's ability to kind of grow this, these, uh, stink molecules, right? Just yeah. to keep it kind of super, super, uh, <laughs> simple, <laughs> super simple. But what we found is, and, and to my point about, and I don't know if it's people's body chemistry or pH or whatever it is. Um, some people have a, a, a really good experience with polygene. Like mm -hmm. myself, I, I have I don't have any problem wearing polygene for three, four days in a row. Yeah. Other people, it just doesn't work, you know, and you, you may be one of them. And so, um, you know, at the end of the day, there's not a right or wrong answer. Yeah. Um, the only thing I say that somebody should not do and the only wrong thing would be any kind of application of cotton in somebody's clothing system. Right. So, you know, if, if, if wool works for you, use it. If synthetic works for you, use it. I, I will sometimes default to wearing a, a lightweight synthetic base layer and then I'll put uh, a slightly heavier wool layer over top. Because what I want is I want that moisture to be pulled away from my skin so that I don't feel wet and clammy. Yeah. But the uh, the wool on the outside can hold the moisture away from my skin. Doesn't really matter. Still that broad temperature range and still all those natural antimicrobials. If I'm whitetail hunting, yeah. I always wear wool. Because I'll do anything I can to try to prevent any kind of stink. Okay. Right? I'm also not going real far. Yeah. Um, you know, But I'm leaving tomorrow to go on a... On a 
12 day moose hunt yep. in BC and I'm, you know, we're going to be around water, et cetera. I'm going to be running full synthetic. You will. I will. And when you say you'll be around water because you can wash it part way through? No. So or... what I mean by that is I will be, a, I will be in a wet environment oh, gotcha. of, of British Columbia. I will yep. be around lakes and rivers. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we may Higher have to, humidity. we may have to cut a bull up in, in the water, you yep. know? And so if, if I'm going to get wet, I want to dry as quickly as possible. Gotcha. I want to be able to potentially, if I get wet, put on some puffy layers at, you know, ultimately if I have to get in my sleeping bag and I can dry out really yeah. quick, um, I can do that with wool. It just doesn't happen as quick. Yeah. So, you know, just my system is I like to run synthetics in more wet environments. Gotcha. You're down in New Mexico running around, really not a lot of water unless you fall in a cattle yeah. trough. Um, <laughs> You know, it, it, it's perfect. Yeah. Um, what, what did you wear on your, on your doll sheep hunt? On my doll sheep hunt, uh, I had uh, Merino. Yeah. I, I had yeah. that new Apex Merino blend. Yep, yep. Uh, and then some, just your old standby, you know, the gray Merino. Right, and, right. And the temperatures were warm. So mm-hmm. if, obviously, if it was one of those hunts where the temps were going to be cold, I'd be thinking differently. I sometimes I will wear a synthetic when I'm heading up to the ridge, uh-huh. and I will get right down to my bare skin and take that synthetic off and throw a merino on once I'm done. Really, see, and I would tell you that myself. save the layer, leave it at home, and just put a puffy jacket on top. And and you know the yeah. term "cook the system dry." I like to say that. Yeah. Um, you know, would save you a layer and weight. Um, gotcha. But either one's going to dry out. And so, yeah, it, there's, there's no, there's no right or wrong. I think what's important is that people understand the pros and cons yeah. of each. So then they can make the best choice for whatever that day or that hunt, you know, yeah. is. Yeah. And um, I, I must have something with my pH because synthetics within two days, uh-huh. I don't like the smell of them. Yeah. And I tell my crew, you need to bring some extra garments with because you guys stink so bad my stomach can't <laughs> handle it. We just got back from, the, this is terrible to say, but it was so hot in New Mexico mm-hmm. and everybody's wearing synthetics. Uh, we washed partway through the hunt. Um, but even when you come back after a long hike and we were, we'd jump in my truck and drive back to camp, mm-hmm. I got home, I washed my seat headwater covers. seat covers yeah, because yeah. they were retaining a little bit of <laughs> rankness. Uh, and I'm one of those guys, I carry, when we're doing a base camp, I actually carry detergent mm-hmm. with me. Uh, and, and I'm probably a little overboard. I, I know my crew thinks, Randy, you're out of hand here. And I'm not doing it because I think that I can fool an elk's nose. Yeah, I, I, you, you can't. can't. No. I'm doing it just because for my own comfort, the sake of the other people. Yep. I just don't want to get reeking real bad. Just your mental health sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> do you do that every day or do you no. do it every couple days? Yeah, it, yeah. I, it's kind of a, a smell test. Yep. Yep. <laughs> wow. This is, and so I always have an extra, whatever it is. I, I, you have some of your synthetics that I, I wear a lot in cold weather. Mm-hmm. Um, just because I'm hiking a lot and I want that evaporation, that, that moisture transfer. And there's days when I just am way more comfortable with that. And I always, starting from now forward, I'll have a puffy coat with me yeah. everywhere I go. Yeah. It, it's Which gets me to a question of some of these are about base layers. And you're yeah. the layer guy more than anyone. But before yeah, we... Yeah, we, we could talk for the next right. eight days probably about this. But yeah. yeah. And... Uh, if if you if we did a bag dump of John Barclow's pack for an archery hunt, mm-hmm. what are the layers you're bringing with you? That's this balance between what I need for comfort and safety versus hey, I don't want forty pounds in my pack. Yeah, what would be your what what would be in your pack besides what you're wearing as that base besides layer? besides what I'm wearing? Yeah, so. Um, you know, these last two hunts in Montana, obviously it's going to be a little different going to BC. Yep. Um, I always bring a puffy jacket yeah, of I, some sort. I don't care what <laughs> time of year it is. Now that, that jacket may change depending on, right. on what it is. Uh, I always bring a puffy jacket. So for most of the, the hunting we did this year, I would bring that Kelvin uh, active jacket. So super lightweight, super breathable, <clears throat> you know, 
not the warmest jacket, but enough just for that type of hunt. Yep. Um, and it's not just the puffy jacket, but I also always bring a wind stopper jacket. Okay. Um, I don't always bring a rain jacket necessarily depending right. on what I'm doing or where I'm going or how far I'm away from the, the truck or the trailhead. I always bring a wind stopper jacket. So, yep. you know, a lot of times um, you don't necessarily need insulation. You need protection from the wind. So the yep. wind will strip the heat away from you, you know, as really quick fast. as anything. Yep. Um, so I bring that lightweight Kelvin active jacket and then kind of my default is the mountain jacket. But a lot of people will run uh, what we call the flash pullover, which is a pullover taped windstopper jacket that actually acts as a really good, uh, even though it's not a rain layer, it acts as a really good rain layer yeah. uh, for those kind of quick squalls and emergency situations. Yep. Um, so I'll run one of those two. And uh, I always bring gloves. Yeah. So some type of, uh, so we have new Merino gloves or Traverse gloves. Yeah. You know, if, if you get your hands wet uh, or they get cold and you can't do the most simple of tasks, like, you know, turn a headlamp on or, or flick a lighter, you know, yeah. you're kind of stuck sometimes or even pull a trigger. Yep. Um, and then I always bring a beanie of some sort, right? Okay. That the, the easiest way to regulate temperature when you're hiking, if I'm cold, I put the beanie on. And when I start to heat up, the first thing I do before I remove a layer is I remove the beanie. And it's kind of yeah. like opening or closing the flue on a chimney, right? Yeah. You're either trapping heat or letting it go. Um, so those, those things are always in, in my kit. And then depending on, again, weather conditions, where I'm going, then I will begin to bring rain gear. Gotcha. Um, if I'm going on a backcountry hunt, obviously nobody can predict the weather for right. five to 10 days. I will uh, always roll with rain gear in my pack. Yeah. Always. Always. When I'm doing a base camp hunt, people ask me this all the time. Randy, where's your rain gear? Uh, back at camp. <laughs> I, I, the, in the later seasons, using uh, the jet stream, which is a, yep. a wind stopper product, right. I, the, I run with that from now till the end of season. Prior to that, I have that flash pullover. Yep. That you're talking yep. about. And, and they're highly water resistant, but I would just caution people that if you're going to someplace like, like I'm going right. or where you d went in the, you know, wherever you went yeah. in Alaska, whatever that range is, where yeah. historically it's wet, yeah. like you need dedicated rain gear of some I, sort. In, in those, so we did Sitka Blacktail as a oh, yeah. back country, just yep. in there, carry it on our back for six days. And then we did the Dull Sheep, which was uh, nine days on our back. With right. those, I don't, and th there's never a question one of the first things in my pack is the storm front. Yeah. Rain yeah. gear. Yeah. It just, I'm not going in there and risking something like that. Right. Now, as I switch to rifle hunting and the temps get a little colder later in the year, I, I always have a puffy jacket. Yep. Um, usually when I leave the trailhead, I have my base layer. Um, maybe a vest, maybe not. But in my pack, I always have my puffy coat and I have my, whatever that wind stopper layer is going yeah. to be. Sometimes I will even have a pair of Merino bottoms mm -hmm. because I've went out elk hunting, got up to the top of the ridge and through the course of today, the day between the wind picking up and the temperature dropping, I'm wishing I would have had a base layer on and I will take my boots off, strip down to my skivvies mm -hmm. and throw a base layer on and then put my... Yeah, my certainly on a backpack, backpack hunt, if I am not wearing um, some base layer bottoms, I always carry those, yeah. always, because you just, from day to day, from actually, you know, morning to evening sometimes, morning to afternoon, it can change that much in the mountains. And I, yeah. I do like to have a base layer bottom. So if they're not on my body, they're in my pack. And the other thing I would say historically I carry uh, is an extra pair of socks, yep. either if I'm in really wet terrain or, you know, I'm spending the night out. Yeah. Um, and I can rotate every other day, every other day and, and get, you know, at least three days out of every pair of socks. Yep. Um, I, I, and people see what I wear, uh, I, in, I wear kind of trek boots and, and, uh, their socks, their new wool socks are just, they've been out for three or four years now. I, I can get a lot of mileage out mm -hmm. of a pair of those on a hunt. And I always have one in my pack. And on the really cold days, if my feet get lathered up on the way up to wherever I'm going to be glassing, I will stop. Sw switch them out. I'll switch them out yeah. in the middle of the day. And it's amazing getting that moisture actually, out of your yeah, boot. Yeah, that's a good call. And getting the moisture away from your, your skin. 
putting on that dry pair of socks, my feet instantly yeah, feel right. like they're 40 degrees warmer. Yeah. Um, so we could, you know, like you said, we could go on oh, yeah. about equipment or clothing based layers forever. Uh, but it leads to another question and you're going to be in a different environment now than what maybe you would have been in, let's say late August, early September. People are asking about sleeping bags, synthetic down. Yeah. You, you have a preference? Yeah. Because I know how much research you've done on this stuff, John. That's why I'm really interested yeah, in your well, thoughts. Yeah, well, so not, not, not just research, but actually like live guinea pig testing. You know, that was, that was really right. where, you know, for 15 years of my life, I mean, that's what they paid me to do. Right. And, and tell the people this, just so they know. I, I know you don't like to boast about it, but your yeah. background is not just a guy who came in off the street. Yeah. So for, you know, 26 years, I was in the military, but, but 15 of those years, you know, I was an instructor... Um, you know, basically teaching special operations guys how to go into remote mountain ranges they'd never been to. And essentially Snyder said it the best, survive like mountaineers, yeah. um, which is take the clothes on your back, um, know how to make them work, leave on your terms and not, not the weathers or the enemy's terms. Right. And, and not only survive, but flourish. And so, yeah. you know, for 15 years, it, it wasn't, you know, I didn't have to buy any gear right? Uh, certainly not with my own money. I mean, I had access to, to every thing that you could possibly want from sleeping bags to tents to clothes to, and then had access to the best designers and developers of all these high-end companies. I could ask them questions. We wouldn't actually just develop the gear, but we would go and try the gear. We would test the gear. We would experiment to see what worked, what didn't work, what we could get away with, what we couldn't get away with. And once we did that, we wrote a curriculum and then taught it to to, 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 to students, right. Taught it to these operators and then was able to complete that feedback loop because we could see, okay, if I'm this, you know, super familiar guy, who's, who's, uh, you know, adapted to my environment. And then somebody comes from San Diego up to Alaska to learn how to live in the cold. It's important for me to, to see how uh, not these guys aren't common men, but to see how people without that experience, uh, took the information and were able to use that equipment because yeah. sometimes, you know, I was jumping ahead four steps where I realized I had to go back to step one and I was already on step five. Yeah. And so that feedback loop was, was huge to be able to kind of complete that cycle and go, okay, here's where we started. Here's where we're going. Here's why we have to, you know, change things, et cetera. So, you know, a, a, enough about that per se, but I, I was able to, to, to try all this stuff and, you know, come up with my own conclusions, see other people, you know, thousands of people, Yep, There's, we were able to, to, to see these. So this isn't just like one data point. Yeah. So folks, that's why John Barclow is the first guy I call <laughs> when I have gear questions, because he has seen it, done it, and seen and done it with thousands of people who are putting themselves in situations way more intense than I'm probably going to be in in the next five years. Pro probably, or yeah. certainly with higher consequences. Yeah. And, you know, by, by, and I need to say this, by no means does that mean that I know everything, and that certainly does not mean that I have stopped learning, because yeah. I am constantly open to new ideas, seeing what other people do. I'm constantly still tweaking my gear, learning stuff, but I've got a pretty good foundation. I'll just say that. Yeah, you do. Um, so to go back to your- Sleeping bag. So to go back to your to your comment or question on sleeping bags, there's, on this one, I really don't have, um, I, I have an opinion. I don't really have a, a middle ground here. I'm, I'm a pro-synthetic sleeping bag person. Wow. Um, so- Traditional down bags, so straight up, you know, uh, duck or goose feather bags. Um, they're great when you're going to super high elevations and climbing, you know, Mount Everest or McKinley or some of these places where it's incredibly dry. It's so cold that you don't have a lot of moisture. Um, and you can still get yourself into predicaments, but, you know, the, 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 the problem with those bags is if you get moisture in those bags, that the feathers come together and begin to clump which reduces their insulation value. Correct. So the, the, the R value, the clo value, all that stuff goes down. And all of a sudden you, you go from a zero degree bag to the end of the trip, you have a 20 degree bag. So you're losing heat. Um, over the course of time, you're starting to get wore down. You're not eating well and you're just cold at night. You're not sleeping well, et cetera. You start a, what I call the vicious cycle. Um, and people say, well, 
but if it's so cold, there's not going to be any moisture in my bag. Well, the reality is when you get in your bag at night, especially if you put your head in the bag, if it's really cold, but even if you don't, your body puts off moisture. And I've heard a bunch of different, uh, you know, amounts, but I won't, I won't give one, but I'll just say you put out a lot of moisture and that moisture goes into the the, the insulation of the bag and slowly works its way through. Well, it doesn't all get through there. And over the course of time, you know, it's going to begin to, to reduce the clove value. Um, so there's that synthetic bag. Um, it, inherently it, it doesn't clump. It doesn't lose its loft. It, it won't, it won't lose that value. Now I, I believe it does. And we've done some testing. It does lose a little bit over the course of time, but it doesn't lose as much. And to me, the sleeping bag is, is re- it's my sanctuary. Yeah. It's my last line of defense. Yep. If shit goes south, sorry, I'm probably not no, allowed to swear. No. But if stuff uh, goes south and, you know, I'm on, I'm on the float trip in Alaska and I fall overboard or we got to cut that moose up and the, and the snowstorm comes in and I got to bail inside my tent and get inside my sleeping bag. I'm, and I've talked, you know, I've done some videos with the Eastman's and stuff. I jump in with my clothes on. And I jump in that bag. So wet clothes, you'll jump in that sleeping bag and cook yourself dry? Correct. Because the alternative is I take those clothes off and I get in the dry sleeping bag and those clothes sit in the corner and freeze solid. And the next day I've got nothing to put on. Gotcha. Or I've got a second pair of clothes, which means I've carried more weight, more bulk than I really wanted to. And I still have to deal with the frozen clothes. So I'd rather deal with the suck factor up front for a short <laughs> amount of time than prolong it. Or the other alternative is you, you take the clothes off, you jump in the bag. Now the next day you wake up and the weather's fantastic and you want to go hunt yeah. And instead you're sitting around camp drying your stuff out. Right. Lost right. Time. So lost time. So, you know, worst case scenario, but I, I, I get in the bag. Well, even if I don't get in the bag, let's say it gets wet for what a, a myriad of reasons. Or let's say I get in and I'm wet, maybe just from putting the tent up and I just got wet on the outside right. and I jumped in. That bag is going to keep me dry, keep me warm for the, for the duration of the trip. I, I don't mean to demean anybody to include myself, but it's idiot proof. I don't have to think about it. This is just a piece of gear that works for me over and over and over and over again. I've got bags I've had for 20 years. Matter of fact, I'm probably going to bring one to BC uh-huh. and it just works for me. Yeah. I just know it's, it's going to be my reliable friend every time. Um, okay. So now let's jump ahead to probably a more uh, controversial topic and, and talk about some of these treated downs. Now we use treated downs in some of our clothing, yeah. but- With treated down in a sleeping bag being, if you consider your sleeping bag, your sanctuary, your last line of defense, like a bit of a a, a survival gear. Right. um, If I get that uh, wet, if I get in there wet, if that bag gets wet, um, the same thing that happens to traditional down will begin to happen to treated downs. Okay. Now... They always like to show the treated down floating on the top of a glass yeah. and they shake it up and it still stays treated. Right. And, and that's true. They're treated. But through my testing, where I have come to find is the, the Achilles heel of treated downs yeah. is in any compression zone. Okay. So I get in a sleeping, so you're laying on I it, get you're in put- a sleeping bag yep. and I get in there and I'm wet or I'm putting moisture out and now I'm rolling around on my side or I'm laying on my back. You have to, yep. something's got to be contacting the ground. Correct that if there's enough moisture that it will begin, it, it does, it doesn't begin, it, it clumps those feathers through compression and those treated feathers are, uh, they don't dry any quicker than traditional down at that point. Okay. So again, is it better than regular down? Yes. Is it as good as synthetic? In my opinion, no. Um, it, there's a compromise. So that's the compromise of treated down is that it can get wet or, and especially through compression. So any kind of long, wet trip that I'm going on, I wouldn't bring that. What's the, what's the downside of synthetic? Not quite as compressible. Right. So it doesn't close up quite as, as, uh, as small. And it's potentially a little bit heavier. Yep. Um, we're working with some stuff right now for some different projects. And, you know, Prima Loft is one of our partners. And, yep. and they've got some amazing things that they're coming out with. And really, you know, they're trying to take synthetics and, and as best they can, you know, mimic down. So 
I know that's a long, kind of no, passionate, drawn-out <laughs> answer, but for me, there is no compromise on sleeping bags. They have to be synthetic if you're going in the backcountry. That is, you've just made a sale, John, <laughs> because I, I have three bags. I yep. have a 25-degree down bag, yep. I have a 10-degree down bag, and I have a minus 15 synthetic. Uh huh. My minus 15 synthetic is when everything goes south, yeah, that's pretty big I'm not going to die. Yeah. But... A 10 degree bag that I'm probably, I'm not going to, I, and I use a liner in my bag uh-huh. just because it's easier to wash the liner yep. than the oh, whole bag. Yeah, for sure. And I actually have an ultralight bivy that sometimes I put on the outside of my bag yep. just to protect it from right. elements and condensation, whatever. Um, but now you got me thinking, maybe I need a 10 degree synthetic bag. Yeah. And I'm not, you know, again, I try not to be no, you, you're, I've got this my opinions, but I this try is, not to be, uh, but you know, the, the down bags are expensive Yeah, and, and the reality is they're not just, they're a little bit more fragile, so they're not going to last quite as long. And, yeah. you know, at the end of the day, when I'm packing up and believe me, I used to be the weight zealot. I mean, to the point where I've compromised safety, you know, to save hmm. six ounces, you know, and not brushed my teeth and all this kind of stuff. <laughs> and, you, you know, I mean, I, when, it, when I was younger, we did that. And honestly, yeah. you know, when we were training guys to go to war, I mean, that was right. the reality. That's yep. just what you do. Yep. Um, but I'm out there to enjoy myself now. Exactly. And the reality is I want to enjoy myself and I also want to come home. And I put my wife through the ringer enough that, you know, I just bought a little inReach mini and, yep. and all this kind of stuff. But, you know, I've, I've lived and hunted in some really really, really harsh environments. And a lot of times I did it by myself and Oof. I had to have a margin of safety there at some point. Yep. And uh, at the end of the day, if it was, you know, six ounces more to have the, the, the peace of mind to know that that sleeping bag, for instance, is going to be there for me every single time. I mean, really what's six ounces? Right. If I'm carrying a hundred pounds of elk out, does six ounces at that <laughs> point matter? No, it really doesn't. Right. You know, the other thing I could argue is maybe I just need to train harder if six ounces is really right. going to make or break me. Yeah. So, you know, but I try, I try to save where I can and I try to save where it doesn't compromise my safety. Yeah. Um, and, but I try to bring the stuff that I know is going to work and kind of, like I say, be idiot proof for me that because, you know, your cognitive function and stuff starts to go over the course of time. You, you've just done yep. two hunts this year. You know, you're not eating good. You're not sleeping as well. Yep. You know, you're not hydrated. And, and you're, 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 the little details sometimes, you know, kind of start to elude you. And that's, you know, going back to the training with your weapon. That's yep. why it's so important to just work on instinct at that point, you yeah. know. But, well, uh, <clears throat> I, like you, I'm always tweaking and looking. Always. And... I am nowhere near where you are as background and experience. For me at this age and with some health issues, comfort is really important to me that if I don't get comfortable and rest well right. and everything, my ability to go day after day after day compromises quickly. Yep. And we were down in uh, uh, Wyoming pronghorn hunting and the wind was howling 50 miles an hour. Wow. And I told my camera guy, I said, you know, I'm going to stay in a motel tonight because <laughs> I, I have this great Hilleberg tent. It, yeah, yeah. It, it's going to stand up to that wind. Absolutely. But yeah. I just hate getting up in the morning, getting buffeted by this wind while I'm trying to get dressed, trying to cook. Trying. Yeah. And he said, he asked me, he said, well, you got back from New Mexico on September 15th and you haven't slept in a tent since then. How many nights have you done in a tent already this year? So we sat down and did the math. I'd already done 29 nights. I was going to say 30. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) And uh, so when you spend as much time in tents and sleeping bags as you and I do, you start paying attention to comforts. And people will say, well, Randy, why do you carry a two-man Hilleberg? Because one one of it is just what we do with production standpoint. I love having the extra space to put cameras and everything out of the elements and not feel like I'm sleeping on a bunch of production gear. And the weight isn't that much more. And I'll be honest, I can be a lot more comfortable in there in really bad weather. Well, and that and that's but that's the thing in really bad weather. Yeah. You know, it, I, I like to say you can get away with something until the day you don't. 
And, <laughs> That's a good way to say it. You know, and in, and in <laughs> certain environments, you can you can push it a little bit. Yeah. You know, but in other environments, I, I don't think it's a good idea to bring a lightweight tarp and a, and a quilt. Yeah. Like because your your margin of error, your margin of safety is cut really really thin. Yeah. Um, and that's not even counting like whatever your bag of tricks, you know, knowledge weighs nothing. So yeah. whatever your knowledge is about starting fires and building shelters and stuff, like we can't even get into that. But, yeah. you know, um, so just one more thing about sleeping bags is when, mm-hmm. you, when you're picking the, the weight. Yeah. Um, so I'm a proponent of sleeping in your clothes. Really? Um, so I, I bought this high-end expensive clothing system. Yeah. It does this amazing job of moving moisture. Yeah. Why am I going to take it off at night and only let it work 18 hours a day for me and then have to bring a heavier sleeping bag to stay warm at night? Okay. When I could get in the bag with my clothes on, any moisture in my system is going to get pushed through. I can bring a lighter weight bag, which means less weight and volume. Okay. Yeah. Um, I have, and I'm, I'm certainly not promoting this, but you know, for 15 years, I ran around uh, probably lower than 12,000 feet. But year round, winter, summer, in mountain ranges with a thirty degree sleeping bag. No way. But it's it's a lot of it's a lot of what I wore. It's a lot of what I ate and drank. So hydration and nutrition are a huge component of that. Yeah. Um, and then there's a couple little tricks that probably can't get into right now. But my point is, I have that sleeping system. Or I have that clothing system now working for me twenty four hours a day. When I get up in the morning, I've already got it on. I can bring a lighter weight bag. So you know, you you get in there with puffy gear on. And a hat and stuff like that. You don't need right. you don't need a zero degree bag if you're going to zero degree temps. You may be able to get away with a twenty degree bag. Wow. So there's a lot there's a lot that goes into it that I you know I don't I don't really hear talked about anywhere. Uh huh. Um, but I've, you'd be you'd be surprised. But at the end of the day, it comes down to people just need to get out and try stuff and yeah. have fun. Like we only get to hunt a couple months out of the year. Right. We can test gear every month, every day if we want to of the year. That's right? a good point. I yeah. Mean, because the opening weekend in Montana, uh, we've already got the plan set. We're gonna pitch our camp at over 9,000 feet. Yeah, so you're gonna have snow. Almost, uh, I mean, just almost count guaranteed. on it. Just and, count on it. And at night, we're gonna have temps probably in the teens, yep. possibly lower. Yep. Uh, and so I'm going through, as you're talking, John, I'm, my mind is making a lot of notes yeah. here of how am I going to do this as efficiently, but yet as comfortably and safely as yeah. possible. Well, and the comfort, I mean, and I think you touched on it without actually saying it, but so the, the one of the biggest things you can do to stay warm um, is get on a good ground pad. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, the ground pad you choose is, is critical. Yeah. You know, anything that holds, holds dead air. So any of the inflatable ones are great. Some have like splank, uh, space blanket type materials, but, but not only warmth, but comfort because my hips just start to ache. Yeah. And, and honestly, if, at the end of the day, if I can't sleep, yeah. I, I'm I, like the clock's ticking. I can only go so many days without sleep before you just can't. Yeah. do it anymore yeah. and i bring so. this little three ounce pillow with me oh I, yeah I, well people who say oh i'll just take my stuff sack and i'll put my my coat in it as my pillow you go right ahead not me <laughs> i'm carrying three ounces and i'm inflating this pillow yeah and then the other thing i found that has kept me from tossing and turning a lot on my sleeping pad is i do take my stuff sack and i put a few clothes in it and i put it right underneath under my your knees. knees yep yeah it, it relieves the pressure on my hips mm-hmm. and keeps me from rolling around because if i roll around while i'm sleeping and i wake up on my right or left hip uh-huh whew, between my shoulder and my hip those pressure points yeah the next morning i feel like i'm 100 years old <laughs> <laughs> and we want to be able to do this till we're 100 uh, so that, that, that's yeah. the hope yeah yeah well that's that's a really good discussion i had i, I don't I, I hope the audience understands that you, we have the benefit here of one of the greatest experts in our industry as it relates to layering and, and gear and clothes. And Unfortunately, if, it doesn't lend itself to short answers. Oh, that's all right. <laughs> that's all right. I bet you everybody listening to this has been taking notes because we did a big, Corey and I did an entire podcast on how what kind of camp, whether it's a bivy backpack camp yeah, versus a, fixed, a base camp. Yeah and why and when we do one or the other. Yep. And this kind of stuff, if we decide we're going to do a backpack or baby type camp, these are 
uh, just absolutely invaluable pieces. And, and people ask me, why do you spend so much time focusing on your sleeping bag in your tent? And I tell them because in the later seasons, when it's getting dark at 5.30 and not getting light till 8 o'clock, I'm spending the majority of my day yeah. Yeah. confined to that. Yeah. You can and, log a lot of miles in there. Yeah. Or a lot of hours. A lot of hours. And yeah. so I want to be comfortable. I, I, yep. I, <laughs> yep. Because the more comfort I have, the better I can hunt the next day and yeah. the next day and the, the next longest, day. And, and luckily this will hopefully this is the longest I will ever be stuck in a tent, but you know, the longest I've been stuck in a tent is four days just because oh, really? of weather. I mean, yeah. you just oh, you mean nonstop, right. Yeah, yeah. Just couldn't get, just yeah. couldn't get out. There was yeah. just no reason to. Well, when we know? were up on Prince of Wales in August, yeah. uh, I was in there for three days and it, I, I did get crazy. out obviously yeah. to go relieve myself, yeah. but misery. Yeah, <laughs> but I had my big Hilleberg, which is a double tent. I was just happy as could be. Hilleberg makes some amazing tents. They will definitely yeah. stand up to the weather, keep you safe, and then they have so many unique designs that yeah. you know. There's definitely one that's probably cut out for you or that particular trip. Or yeah, yeah. Well, I've got this whole list of of emails here, John. Are there any in, in elk hunting specific uh, things that you kind of have in your gear list or in your bag that you're thinking, oh, not many people do this. I don't know if I should tell the world. Or are there, any, oh, you, because you say you're always learning. Yeah. And you're always adapting and, and you're not married to any solution except those solutions that work. Right. Um, for our listeners, any that when you discovered them were, Play, or were discoveries where you said, oh man, how did I live without this? I, I don't know if it's a piece of gear. Um, it, it, it's, it's refinement of systems. You know, if we, yeah. if, if we want to, for instance, keep to the, uh, keep to the backpack hunting, yeah. you know, which I know a lot of people do, you know, the way, the way I, pro so I don't have to eat a lot of food. That's, yeah. that's a benefit to me yeah. um, to, to keep, functioning either today or a day in the mountains. But, yeah. um, yeah, I, li I like to do what we call it in the military field stripping our meals. So I know some people make their own freeze dried. Right. Um, I'm a person that <laughs> probably goes against what everybody else is saying right now, but I have no problem eating mountain house. Yeah. Matter of fact, if I was a single guy and I had a bunch <laughs> of mountain house in my garage, I, 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 I could probably go a month eating Mountain House for dinner and, uh, and not even blink an eye. But, um, but what I do with, with those types of meals is I, I take them out of the, the packaging. I put them in a, a quality uh, freezer Ziploc bag, and then I supplement them. So I'll supplement them with, you know, any kind of seasoning I want or uh, dry cheese, beef jerky, anything I can to kind of up the, up the calories, um, kind of get it balance where I want it to be. Um, a lot of times I'll carry a little, uh, uh, you know, squeeze tube of, uh, different, different oils, almond oil, avocado oil, okay. olive oil, something like that to add fat, especially when it's, when you're getting cold and getting in these later seasons, but I'll field strip those meals. I'll put them in the either gallon Ziploc or I'll split it into two quart size Ziplocs. Um, and then I roll them up. And one thing you'll notice is one, it, makes a much smaller package than the prepackaged stuff. Yep. Um, it produces a lot less uh, trash and it's a lot less weight, right? So yep. I can get a lot more of those meals into a smaller, uh, smaller area. The other thing I do, which is completely kind of counter to what, what most people do is that because I've got that quality zipper freeze, uh, uh, zippered bag, um, freezer bag that I boil my water, and I pour the hot water right into that bag yep. and I eat it out of the bag. And quite frankly, if you don't like eating out of a bag, then you're probably yeah. in the wrong line of work. Exactly. I we used to like to say, but you know, if you're, if you're cooking food in a cook pot, you're going to eventually at some point make yourself sick. But then I have this bag, right? And so that bag, that first one becomes a trash bag for the entire trip. Yep. And then, you know, not to get too graphic, but if it's bad weather or something like that, that Ziploc, which is next to me, you know, say that night's meals, not the one with all the trash in it. I may urinate in that bag in the middle of the night. 
um, for, for, for various reasons. I yeah. don't want to go stumbling around in grizzly bear country in the middle right. of the night and all that kind of stuff. Or you're already warm. You don't want to go out when it's 20 below. And, right. Correct. Yeah. And subject yourself to the elements. So, yeah. you know, just, I think what, if people went ahead and, and started field stripping all their food and, and kind of combining like all their, their, uh, what are those things, uh, honey stingers and stuff yep. like that. Like you'd be amazed at how much less weight and bulk you're carrying. I'm not compromising my safety. I'm just trying to be efficient. Yeah. Um, that's one thing. The other thing I like to carry, uh, outside of food is I like to carry a small little foam pad to sit on. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, if I'm sitting there glassing, yeah, my butt's going to get cold if I sit right on the, right on the uh, rock, right on the rock or, or yep. the ground. And so again, that comfort thing, you know, that's just another thing that I do. Yeah. Um, and then the other thing is I always bring a small Ziploc and spices for when I shoot them grouse. Cause I am, <laughs> I am, I am maybe not a grouseaholic like you, but I am, I am a, I am a close runner up. Really? I won't necessarily get off a stock to go shoot a grouse, but yeah. But they have distracted me a lot. And where we hunted uh, this year in Montana, I think the grouse population took a bit of a hit. Oh, really? Didn't see okay. nearly as many, but we were still able to to yeah. bring a few back to the pot. I, it's unbelievable. When we were in that doll sheep hunt, the, oh, the guys with us the ptarmigan killed the ptarmigan with yeah. rocks. Yeah. And we, we, they brought them back to camp. They probably thought that I had lost my mind. I am pulling the skin off those things, and I had them on a fire so fast. <laughs> And they went like candy. Uh, yeah. Pot. It, yeah, I, I got to get over that grouse issue. It annoys Corey when we hunt together because he's running after a bugle and I see a grouse. I just stop. I'm, it's not, just, I'm it's a target of opportunity. Exactly. I'm and shooting. they're delicious. Yeah. Until there are no grouse left or all the arrows in my quiver are broke. Yeah. Those grouse are not safe. I, I have some, <laughs> had some amazingly expensive grouse meals. Right. When people say, how can, you, how can you justify a $35 arrow and broadhead combination for a grouse? I tell them, it's worth it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, John, those are really, really good things. I, I started cheating uh, a bit in the last couple of years after talking to you with this, what you called stripping your meals. Yeah. Um, I've, I've been doing that some, uh, sometimes we get in a hurry and I, we're just going from one place to another, to another, yeah. to another. Yep. Uh, and I end up leaving them in the, the regular foil bags. The other thing I've been doing is I've been bringing some, one of the things that you were talking about is uh, stuff to supplement those meals. Mm -hmm. uh, there's hardly a breakfast thing I I find that I don't like raisins in. Uh, hmm. It just I don't know. It's almost like my reward. Oh, there's a raisin. <laughs> well, and you want you yeah. want to bring food that you're going to eat. Yeah, because especially when you start getting run down physically, like sometimes the last thing you want to do is eat. Yeah, but you have to. Yeah, you know, and uh, so you know I'm. Probably not to disclose too much, but I'm I'm a chili mac guy, and I've I've eaten oh, yeah? chili mac for ten days oh, straight. No. Oh no! Now my partners didn't necessarily care for that, <laughs> but I'm like, hey, it works for me, you know. Yeah. But I I, w I didn't mind eating it every day. Really? So wow. uh, I I would say of all the mountain houses, I'm either a chicken and noodles or a teriyaki chicken guy. Yeah. Those, those yeah. Are, I used to be on a beef stew kick, and then beef I, stew's I, good I when I, it's cold. Yeah, yeah, I got over that. Uh, and then if we're doing base camps, my wife makes, she, she home cooks. Stuff I, I've seen, I've seen you post those. The yeah. video. Yeah. yeah. She makes these unbelievable meals. We put them in the food saver. You get back to camp, you have your stove and we just leave this big pot of water on the stove for the uh -huh. whole hunt. You, you use the same pot of water every day. You put that freezer bag in there mm. and you it, by the time it comes to a boil, you let it go for about five more minutes. You open it up, and there's antelope lasagna, or, oh my gosh, or elk yeah. chili, or you know whatever it is, and yeah. that's the benefit of these base camp hunts. Yeah, well, I, I love to eat, hunts. and and actually, I, I love to cook. I really enjoy cooking. I cook every night that I'm at home. I yeah. I, I, wow. I cook dinner, and not just like something small. Like I I make. I really enjoy it. Yeah. But when I'm out hunting, yeah, I'm I'm there to hunt. hunt. I'm not there to eat, yeah. and it's like my one opportunity to not have to worry about yeah. it. I don't want to put a lot of effort into my me, eating, me and either. I probably should try some of these. I've heard great things about some of these other freeze dried um, meals, and I just haven't 
Yeah, I just haven't I, tried we've them We've been yet, experimenting but, them with yeah. them this year. There are some out there that are good, and then oh, I'm there, sure there are, there are yeah. some that cause you to say, "How is this company going to stay in business?" Yeah, I tried. I tried. <laughs> uh, I tried a couple this last month in Montana that I wasn't. I wasn't super fond of. But uh, yeah. to your point, though, about being efficient with your time, when we come in. The camera crew is downloading footage, right. backing up media, charging batteries. They're busy, so it's it falls on me to kind of cook dinner. Mm -hmm. And I'm with you. I, I want it to be as quick in preparation, as valuable to us as possible, and as easy with cleanup. Yeah, right. I, the, the cleanup is even I, more important. I, 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 you're never going to see me whipping out the big skillet and making a big deal. Uh, I always carry... Uh, one of those gallon freezer bags that you're talking about with marinade already in it, the powder oh, marinade uh -huh. with whatever seasonings I want to. And so many people think that this is proprietary. I said, well, <laughs> this is my wife's, my wife's top secret. But I did a video the other day because I I'd shot this antelope in Wyoming and the tenderloins were sitting there in my fridge and I said, I, I got to eat these today. And I thought, well, I better let the cat out of the bag. Really, the base marinade for me starts with Lowry's beef marinade. You okay. can get it in the package. Uh -huh. I've tried everything out there. I've not found anything as simple and easy as that. You put it in there, two-thirds a cup of water. Okay. And within an hour, it's starting to work. But uh, I put other seasonings in there. I saw whether it's a you know an antelope, I'll do this extra seasoning and blah, 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 mm -hmm. blah, blah. And so I carry that with in my pack. And we've started now, and on the doll sheep hunt, we did this. Uh, I, I throw a chunk of backstrap in there and let it marinate overnight. And the next day when we come in, or even that night, uh, if it's we're just starved, it's just unbelievable. Oh, yeah. It's a way to take what we've just harvested yeah. hours earlier and convert it. It's into, just a blessing, right, to be able to do that. I mean, yeah. you're like, how lucky are we to be able to... And it, even though it tastes amazing at home, it will never taste better than right. out on that mountain. <laughs> For sure. Never taste as good. Yeah. Yep. And we'll roast them on a stick. We'll do whatever. And when I know on this bison hunt I'm going on next week, if we're lucky and I end up putting an arrow on one, I am just, uh, my cheeks already hurt thinking about <laughs> eating those tenderloins when we're down there. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. Uh, but, well, John, I know you're on a on a schedule, unlike yeah. me, so I'm going to have to let you go. I'm not sure we got through all 159. We didn't. <laughs> we I think we got about four of them. <laughs> that. So I guess the good news is that leaves a lot of questions yeah. for for the next time Corey and I to get together. Um, but uh, well, like I told you, I've really been enjoying uh, the podcast with you too, and well, thanks, and the guests you've had on. So yeah, it's yeah. been great. I listen uh, to all of them. Like I said, I'm. I'm a sponge. I want to be as good as I can be an elk hunter. And well, I appreciate it because when I think it was in May, I came over here and you and I visited. Yeah. And you really encouraged me to do this. I said, "Oh gosh, I don't know if anyone will listen to a podcast about <laughs> elk hunting." And and I would say you were one of the guys who kind of pushed me out of the gate. Well, because I was selfish, I wanted to hear it. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, thanks for sharing all your knowledge with our audience. I think what we're going to have to do is after hunting season, we'll have to get you on again, so that the audience can send in. And this is a call for questions, folks. If you want more gear technology answers. John Barclow, hands down, is the guy in the industry who can answer them, whether they're clothing specific. I mean, you work for Sitka, so people probably think they got to be clothing specific, but... Not necessarily. You, right. They, we have at our disposal, if we <laughs> want to say that, to our benefit, the best mind, the most experienced mind of this stuff right here in John Barclow. So... Send us your questions if you want. If there's, I know there's a lot of stuff we didn't answer. We just barely picked the scab here. Uh, but I'd love for the audience to send us more and we'll yeah, no, I'd love to come back and, season and yeah, and do more of it. It'd be fun to get so, Corey on here too, right? Yeah. yeah. Love to, I've, I don't think I've ever been on a podcast with Corey. Oh, really? So I don't oh. think so. Well, yeah. We'll, I'll just tell him, you know what? You need to quit <laughs> doing all this stuff that makes money, and you need to come here, come here and do a podcast with John. And, well, and I'm myself. excited he's so, doing that that hunt this week. So yeah, I am too. He does it every year, and it's so generous of him because he's a, such a busy person. But he, it's important. To yeah. Him. Well, it says so, a lot about him. Yeah. 
Well, folks, thanks for listening. John Barclow, I can't thank you enough. Thanks, really, Randy. Really appreciate it. And uh, good luck up in British Columbia. Yeah, thanks. You too. Down in Utah, right? Yep. Yeah, yeah. fantastic. We'll, we'll, uh, we'll compare notes after the season. There we go. Okay. Thanks, folks. Have a great season.